Well, hey there, welcome back to another Eye Care for Your Brain Bite Size with me, board certified neuropsychologist, Dr. Karen Sullivan. We are here today to talk about the secret that brain health doctors know, but doesn't get passed along to you in the general public. And why this is so important to me is because I indeed do care for your brain, and I know that you do too. If you ask people what are the things they're most concerned about as they get older, they outrank mental health cognitive health, brain health, far above anything else. Physical disability, social security reform, uh, physical debility, uh, the ability to stay socially connected. The thing that seems to matter most to people is their ability to stay cognitively strong. And people really want to talk to their doctors about this issue, but 70% of us get our issues uh, informed by popular media. And the reason we get concerned is that corporations who are selling a product are also the ones who are sponsoring these media messages. So what I'm really talking about here are the false promises, all the supplements, the computer games, the phone apps, the brain health fitness industry that encourages you to really be alone at home with a device trying to do things that are going to sharpen your brain. Well, the vast majority of these brain health products have no scientific merit and really rob you of three vital resources. These would be your time, your money and not least of all is your hope you're feeling like they're actually going to do something and give you a return on your investment any brain health expert that i've ever known knows that these products are bogus that they are a form of exploitation they're really garbage and we all know and talk amongst ourselves what really results in brain health. And part of the reason I do these free lectures here on YouTube and Facebook is to let you know what is really going on in the minds of the smartest people in neuroscience. So today, that's really what we're gonna talk about. So one of the questions I have asked myself in the last few years is why has this eight to $10 billion brain health fitness industry exploded? If we know it's garbage, why has it been so successful? Well, first of all, there's just more older adults. And as you get older, the more we care about the health of our brain, we should always be caring about it. But the truth is it does seem to become more of a priority as we get older typically because we think of dementia as being more likely. So age is the number one risk factor for dementia. We wanna make sure that we don't mistake that though for feeling like age inevitably results in all the subtypes of dementia. For every five years over 65 we are, our risk for the subtypes of dementia does double, but there's plenty of people in their 70s, 80s, 90s, and into their hundreds who remain very cognitively vibrant. Dementia causes more fear than anything else in older adults. So if you give people a choice of being buried alive, being bitten to death by poisonous snakes, being in another 9-11 type terrorist attack, or dying from Alzheimer's disease, many people pick anything but the Alzheimer's disease. And part of this is that we don't treat people with dementia very well. We tend to objectify them and the care almost internationally is, is really subpar. It's not at the progressive innovative level that we all know and, and believe it should be at. There's also a general lack of knowledge about what is healthy brain aging, what is not. These corporate sponsored messages about aging would love you to think that any little blip is a sign of the inevitable boom, the inevitable hammer of dementia that is coming down. So they really like to pathologize normal brain related changes like forgetting your keys, forgetting where you parked. They would love for you to think that that's the beginning of the end and you rush and buy their product. We have a lack of access to scientifically robust brain health information. I think that's part of why you're here is maybe over the last six years you have come to depend on the I Care For Your Brain channel as a resource for objective truth telling and that is something that I deeply appreciate. We do not have enough clinicians, enough 
doctors with expertise in the aging brain. And maybe most of all is we do have a decline in the face-to-face -face time with our medical providers. Follow-ups are anywhere from seven to nine minutes typically in America with our medical providers. And it's really hard to get a comfort level in that short amount of time that would allow you to divulge something as significant as I'm worried about my memory or, you know, I'm worried about my mood. It is also human nature to just want a quick fix. I have had plenty of issues in my life where, boy, I would love to take a pill for that. I would love to take something natural, a supplement to eradicate or manage that problem. It's just that we're just not there yet for the vast majority of brain health issues. So there's really six problems, and then I'm going to get to the solution. Uh, we have a lot of exaggerated or misleading claims in the brain fitness product world that the essence of what they're doing is really exploiting anxiety about dementia. They often treat the brain like it's a standalone biological construct, like it's not rooted in social health or mental health or spiritual health. We are human first, brain second. Uh, it is very one size fits all. So the brain is infinitely complex. You know, think of things like space. <laughs> uh, our brain is fairly well known by some of the brightest minds in the world who study uh, you know, hardcore neuroscience, but we have plenty of elements of the brain that we are still learning about. And so this idea that one pill or one game is going to come in and prevent dementia, reverse dementia, reverse memory loss, it's just really too simplistic. There's never gonna be a one intervention uh, solution. We also know that none of the over-the-counter medications that consider themselves to be smart drugs have done anything impressive in robust clinical trials uh, and may even be unsafe. A lot of these products ignore the impact of community. So I had said this earlier that a lot of them ask you to be home alone on a device, you know, connecting dots, putting animals into barns. Um, this is not what is considered to be a brain healthy environment. We need enriched environments that are very interdependent with other beings, humans, animals, the whole nine yards. And the final one is when they're selling you something, it's really hard to know if they are objective. But here's the thing, the excitement behind what they're talking about is actually justified, but the reason they can't capitalize on it is because so much of true brain health is driven by behaviors and not products. So that's part of why I talk about what to do, what not to do, because it's not something that's going to be a simple one size fits all fix. So we have made dramatic advances in neuroplasticity, the brain's miraculous ability to strengthen connections between neurons, to respond accordingly to the demands of the environment, we know through several decades of really strong research on what we call enriched environments, what makes a strong disease resistant brain. So their theory is right, but their methods are wrong. So that's kind of how I'm setting you up in the problem. The next part of this lecture is what you're here for, which is, well, okay, so what's the solution? So the secret that brain health doctors, brain health scientists all know is that there is a formula to understand brain health for each individual. And it is a ratio between risk factors and what we call cognitive reserve or protective factor. So if you figure these, this is in essence what a neuropsychologist does. We are individualizing this approach using cognitive tests, our review of medical records, medications, conditions, our interviews with people, trying to really pinpoint what are the specific risk factors. So what needs to change and what are the protective factors? What are they doing right? And what could they do more of? So when we start to think of risk factors, you're gonna think of them in two ways. We have non-modifiable and we have modifiable. Non-modifiable is really two things that you can't change. There's nothing I can tell you today that will make any difference. And then we have 15 things that are changeable, modifiable. So within the two non-modifiable, we have your age, and we have your genes. We have very specific genetic changes, either variants or mutations that either determine you are gonna get that dementia no matter what you did. And one of the rules of thumb to know is the younger you are when you are diagnosed or have symptoms of dementia, the more likely it is to be genetic. So when you are trying to gauge family history, think about the age at which people were 
when they started to have their symptoms and that should give you a general sense of how concerned you should be about your genetics many of us have variants so most of us who have a family history of folks in their 80s in their 90s who had some dementia it's very likely that what happened is there was a synergistic effect between a genetic risk factor and one of these 15 modifiable risk factors that come together kind of in a lock and key fit and then the genetic predisposition is exposed and then ultimately we have the expression of the disease. So within the 15 top 15 things that are risk factors for the brain, and there's a little bit of debate about this, but this is a literature that I've kept up with very closely since becoming a neuropsychologist, probably the number one risk factor for less than optimal brain health with age is hypertension, high blood pressure, when it goes too high, when it goes too low. We then have poorly controlled type two diabetes, poorly controlled cholesterol, untreated sleep apnea. They all kind of group together and we think of those as vascular risk factors. Then we have multiple head injuries. So over about four or five, the longer the length of unconsciousness, the more we worry. Untreated hearing loss, untreated vision loss, polypharmacy, which is taking more than five medications, multiple bouts of delirium, which is something that typically happens in the setting of an infection or being in the hospital or coming on or off new medications, too much alcohol, smoking, sedentary lifestyle, poor diet, social isolation, depression, and low mental stimulation. So all of that are your risk factors, right? And you can figure out some of that on your own or you can work with a board certified neuropsychologist and do cognitive testing to really tease out which one of those are at play for you. So that's kind of the, the danger zone. On the other side is the buffer. These are the cognitive reserve, the protective factors. So about 25% of people who have the brain pathology, the plaques and tangles of Alzheimer's disease, which we believe to be beta amyloid and tau, misshapen, sticky proteins that build up in the cells, outside the brain cells, and ultimately suffocate them. About 25%, one in four, have this going on at the level of the brain, but have normal memory. So this was really the work to come out of Yakov Stern's lab in New York City a few decades ago. And he studied the one in the one in four and figured out that they had very robust early education. They had complex jobs throughout life where there was a lot of interpersonal activity. And maybe most importantly, their hobbies had some degree of intellectual stimulation, cognitive engagement, and increasing expertise over time. So the earlier you laid down the cognitive reserve, the better, but it's also true that it's never too late. So this is where lifestyle comes in. And this is really the secret. So the, the secret is brain health is not going to come to us by doing just one intervention. So we all know exercise is good for the brain, right? If you just focused on exercise, but exercise, but we're lonely, that's gonna counteract some of the exercise benefits. If you eat a tremendously healthy anti-inflammatory diet, but you never move your body, you're not really getting the full benefits of the diet. So what we really know is that throughout life, there is a cumulative effect of all of the things we do that are protective for the brain. So this really has been proven in research studies like the finger trial that I'm gonna tell you about in a little bit. And this is really the, the secret, the, the most coveted secret of all, which is that you need all the brain health interventions. It's not gonna come to you with one thing or two things or three things. What we really focus on now is what we call multifactorial lifestyle interventions. This is really across all spheres of life trying to do things that have repetition. So you do one specific thing more and more and more, be consistent over time. It also has to involve novelty. You can't just do the same thing day in and day out, always do the easy Sudoku, always do the easy crossword and think that it's really gonna build up any kind of brain buffer, cause it's not. We need you to consistently be building, challenging yourself, working towards expertise. And doing this results in stronger and more connected brain cells that can buffer or withstand the impact of the different subtypes of dementia. We also know that a higher level of cognitive reserve helps us compensate better. So just because we can't do things the way we always did, 
we have to find other compensatory strategies doesn't mean there's a problem. So if you are in your 70s or 80s and you used to be able to go to the grocery store with no list, but now you have to write a list, I am not concerned one bit if the list works. If you write a list and forget things, then we get a little bit concerned. But if you are able to implement a strategy, that is really not concerning at all. That's actually a sign of intact executive function. So in the worldwide finger study, this is based in Finland, but it's ongoing multi centers around the world. It is a randomized double blind placebo controlled study. And what we're really looking at is getting people 60 to 77 together to either do nutrition, diet, cognitive engagement, be social, manage their vascular risk factor, make sure their glucose is good, make sure their inflammation is low, and comparing them to people who just got business as usual, normal health advice. And after two years, when we study the people who got the multidisciplinary intervention, they are doing about 25% better than the people who just got medicine as usual. So this in the world of science is actually a pretty robust study and really tells us that that is giving you a huge leg up if you understand what to do proactively for brain health, you really can exert control over the future of your risk for getting dementia. So they also looked at people, they carved out people in these studies who were at higher genetic risk for dementias, including Alzheimer's disease, and found that they too also had this robust effect. So what we can deduce from there is even when you have some genetic susceptibility, increased relative to your peers, you can be proactive and actually make a dent in it. Our, our genes are not always our true destiny. We are able to have some level of control on their expression and how much we are able to compensate for those changes. So I hope that this was inspiring to you. I hope that this is something you're gonna take forward with you and try to watch more of the evidence-based lectures here on my channel. Please make sure you're a subscriber so you don't miss any in the future. And let me know what you think. I wanna know what are your top five things that you value most in your journey to have optimal brain health as you get older. I wanna know which ones, and I want them in order. I wanna know number one, which one you think is most important, second, third, fourth, and fifth, because other people are gonna be reading your comments, and this is a community. We all want to learn from the expertise of each other, and I'm not the only expert here. All of you who have brains, who are working hard to be healthy, you're walking around with a lot of knowledge up here too, so I hope that you will share it. Thank you guys so much, and I'll see you next time. Bye.